amazing what God's doing today. And, and you know, God's not doing something to the world. He's doing something to his remnant. How many sang that? How many sang the song? You know, use the words that were in the songs. I want more of you, Yahweh. I want more of you. Okay, let me just caution you. And this is what's happening to the church today. They're singing songs like this. God doesn't take these words lightly. Deuteronomy 8.3 says, if you, want, if you really want to know God, be foolish enough to ask for more of God. Because God's going to test you. He says, I'm going to test my people to see what's in them. If he's testing his people to see what's in, in them, what's in you? Remember what Messiah said, you are clean because I put my word into you. What is the word? Every one of the prophets said, and the word of the Lord came to me. The word of the Lord, we see that John said, is Mashiach, Messiah. And Messiah taught an amazing concept. You know, it's interesting to note that we as, as the Torah terrorists that we call ourselves, we sit around and we, we, we meditate, we midrash, and it's like, what does it really mean to shave, not shave the corners of your beard? <laughs> you know, it's like, well, it, it, you know, I, I love the fact that if you look at Orthodox, not all rabbinics, but Orthodox Judaism has blessed the Jewish-owned razor companies. And so now if you own a Remington and you use it, you're not shaving the corners of your beard, you're just trimming it. So kosher is okay. And it's, so we sort of, sort of manipulate the Word of God. But... We sit around and we midrash over, well, is bacon kosher or is turkey bacon okay? And we get caught up in these midrashes. And here Messiah never taught the literal application of the Torah. He taught the Torah in such a way that they didn't understand it. Now, it's amazing because we see our predecessors in, in the religious concepts of protesting, or I mean Protestant, we see that they believe that since Jesus, Yeshua, didn't teach the Torah that it must be done away with. But let me just take you through a lesson today that which we did last night. Everything Messiah taught was a greater understanding of the Torah. The weightier matters in, in Matthew 23. What are the weightier matters of the Torah? And I believe that in these days we can still get caught up in the ritual application of the law or we can be the ones that, that emulate Messiah. I just happened to go for a walk this morning. I don't know why. But... Uh, I walked around past Brother Tom's neighborhood, and I, I, I met him. The, the streets were empty. I was walking the streets and because I'm a street walker. And I was walking the streets, and at the end of Miller Woods was a guy standing in the driveway watching me walk down his street. So I said to myself, Lord, what's this guy doing? Why did you put him there? The Lord didn't answer me, but he said he's there. Okay. I'll turn around before I get there. But I had already made up my mind to go to the end of the street, so I had to go by him. And he says, uh, he, know, he knew his neighbors. Are, are you from this area? I said, no, I'm, I'm visiting Brother Tom down the street. Brother Tom, are you a believer? I said, yes, are you? He didn't say yes. He said, I'm a Baptist, Southern Baptist. So I immediately said, there's no Baptist in heaven. No, I didn't say <laughs> There are no Messianics either. <laughs> there are no Catholics. There's only going to be the remnant of God. And so uh, I began to share with them some things about the fact that we've done a great job causing division, and God's going to raise up a people. And I said, you're standing out here. You're the first house at the, at the beginning of this neighborhood, and it's time that you stop being a Baptist and you start raising up Messiah and pray for every car that goes by and pray for every house. And he goes, wow, you're right. <laughs> because I've chosen... To be a pain in the neck. That's why Pastor Nick brings me here. He has this illusion, I'm going to straighten you guys out. <laughs> but we've discovered it's not going to happen. That you're in God's hands, not mine or Pastor Nick's. You know, how many here believe in gathering? Yeah. Amen. Woo! If you're not gathering, what, is, what did Messiah say you're doing? How many here are good at scattering? Yeah, we, we all are. One honest person. Praise God. Thank you, Tim. Take a bow. So. <laughs> we're gathering, but we're also scattering because we haven't let the concept that Susie was singing up there set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain and I can't control. Say, say to the guy next to you, 
Are you out of control? If you understand, that's, that's a scripture right out of Paul's teaching. He said, don't take a thought for what you're going to say. So I'm walking down the neighborhood. I see this guy in his jogging suit, all official, you know, and I'm an old, fat, short guy walking down the street, you know, with my metal detector like Nixon or something on the beach, you know. So like, oh, God, what am I going to say? God says, don't worry about what you're going to say. I didn't plan on asking this guy to pray for the neighborhood. I mean, it was obvious that he knew Brother Tom. He already knew that Tom was one of those weird guys that goes to church on Saturday. Because I said, I've got to go because I've got to get dressed, take a shower. For We're Sabbath keepers. But it doesn't matter. We have the same Lord. You know, and see, we, we don't understand that there are many different crowns or, or jewels in our crown. And there are the least, even Messiah said, there's the least in the kingdom and the greatest. Now, I believe that we basically are chosen to be the least. Bear with me is because we've been chosen to walk in the ritual application of the law. But through that, by the Spirit of God, God's raising up those that keep the bridge, the keepers of the ordinances of God and the Spirit of God. And the bridge that we are is between the stick called Judah or the natural branches branches, and the anointed concept of of who Ephraim is, the lost sheep. And God's bringing it together. There's only one house, and that house is rising up today because of you, those that walk by spirit. We see there's so many teachings about the spirit. If you're not walking by the spirit, spirit, literally, you're in sin. What does sin mean? What is the Hebrew word for sin? Hata. And what does it mean, Pastor Nick? Missing the mark. So we've been missing the mark. I, I enjoyed listening to my wife on, on the little offering sermon was the fact that, that we are the concepts of we've been robbing God's storehouse. And we always say, well, yeah, because we don't tithe. We don't write that check. God doesn't want your 10%. He wants all of you. He wants you. We've robbed a storehouse because if we literally are believers in Messiah, anybody here love Messiah? Well, if somebody were to say to me, do you love your wife? I go, yeah, I guess so. Glory to God, I've been married 42 years. I'm still, I, I'm still bananas over this Chiquita woman. Do you love Messiah? Oh, finally, a little passion in the, in the place. If we love Messiah, we should be excited about Messiah. We should be getting out of bed saying, praise God, this holy ground, God, anoint me today to serve you with all my heart. Let today be the day in which I have divine appointments. But what am I going to say, God? I don't care. I don't care. I'll put it into you, and it'll be like a fire that's out of control. Jeremiah 23 says that, isn't my word like a fire? And where did Messiah say he put the word? In who? Look at somebody and say, is it in you? Then why are you a passive Brandonite? Or, you know, for those that are really elite from, why mama? Or Valrico. You live in Valrico, don't you? I I saw your address once. It's too bad. And so uh, (laughs) God's raising up a people. How come come these seats aren't full? It's not my fault. You know, I've got a big name. (laughs) Can't you tell everybody, oh, Pastor Curtis in town, let's bring Billy Graham with him. You know, hallelujah. It's not about my name. It's about the Spirit of God. We do have a couple over here that, that drove 100 miles. And, and you know, it's, it's amazing because Brother Kirk is blind, and I just see him driving with a white stick down the, sticking out the window while he's driving. And it's like, <laughs> thank God Deborah drove. But it's amazing because God's calling you to bring people into the house of the Lord. I was glad when they said to me, let us go up to the house of the Lord. Do you know what God said? I'll meet you on Monday. No, he didn't say that. Uh, I'll meet you at Sunday, sir. No, he didn't say that. I will meet my people on Shabbat. Shabbat was made for you. And what do we do on Shabbat? What's your purpose? Why do you even come to church? To get a booster shot? You know, many of you come to church to make sure that you, you pay your dues, because if you don't, you might go to hell. How many here would serve God if there was no promise of heaven? 
How many here are born again someday? How many here are going to live forever someday? How many here know that you're going to live forever starting today? That you're going to serve God today? That my focus is not heaven. My focus is to serve him and be obedient to him and to be his vessel and his spirit of living water. If God's real, then he's alive. He died for a purpose to redeem Israel, to forgive their sins for missing the mark, and to restore the kingdom of God through the remnant. And the disciples who were confused, who, who followed Yeshua to set up his kingdom on downtown Ben Yehuda Street, where all the vendors are, he, was, he died for that purpose, and yet he up and died, and everything that Peter believed in was out the window. So Peter said, forget it, I'm going fishing. Peter didn't go fishing because he was a fisher of men. He went fishing because that was his old business. He needed to make some money. Been hanging out with Messiah for three years. It's like, hey, I, I got to feed my mother-in-law. Just look at Yithro, Jethro. Number one, the miracle is Moses listened to his father-in-law. You know, look at Brother Tom said, you know, my father-in-law is going to go with me to work. It's like, and, he, and, and it was funny because he went to his wife and said, honey, don't make him go with me. It's like... <laughs> It's like, I remember my father-in-law. You know, we all, anybody, any married men have a father-in-law that's still alive? Do you, do you just can't wait for his wisdom? <laughs> Some of you. But the point is making is, is he listened and he obeyed. And I'm, I want to get into this leadership concept Monday night. But today I want to take you back through this concept that Messiah didn't teach the literal application of the Torah. He took the Torah and expounded on it. For instance, did he talk about murder? Now, he knew that murder was a, a violation of, of the Torah, the original Torah, and yet he expounded on it. It says, even if you look at a person cross-eyed, you've committed murder. He's expounded on the spiritual realms, which we call the hidden meaning. So the Peshat, the simple understanding, is if you shoot that guy, you're guilty of murder. He didn't say do not kill. He says do not murder. And so when we see the Peshat, we see the simple meaning. But he also be began to use other scriptures. He said, it has been said. Or it has been written. So we see that it was a reference to Ramez. And we understand that we as, as people that come together on a Bible study and, and in our groups, for instance, you know the most important thing in your family is Midrash. If we're not teaching our kids the Torah, then they're going to walk out into this world and they're going to leave the fellowship of the anointing because statistics say that the church is losing 88% of all of its kids between the ages of 17 and 21 because we're not teaching them how to transfer this parents' religion into their hearts. And I'll, I'll just tell you right now, if your kids aren't asking you questions, you might as well get on your face and say they're lost. That's what statistics say. The Midrash gets your family into it. It's like, how come Moses did this? What is Exodus 19, or excuse me, Exodus 13, Exodus 13 when you're talking about the, 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 the Pesach in latter days, it says, when your kids ask you why we do this, are your kids asking you questions? If your kids aren't asking your questions, you better start fearing God. That's what the fear of God is all about. The covering you have over these children and the anointing you have over the people in your life and your neighborhood as well. I want to ask you today, when you go home and you drive, you turn down your street, stop for a second and point to these houses and say, Father God, I pray for these houses. I pray for my street. I don't know if they're going to get saved or become messianics. I don't know, but God's will be done. I used to go in the hospitals. I was a hospice volunteer. I've got a whole bunch of history in my life about weird things. But, you know, you'd pray for people, and it's like, when I pray for people, boom, I was Pentecostal. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah, I want to see stand up and rise. Well, I'm on my deathbed. I don't care. Just get up and throw your, throw your crutches out the window. Throw you know, we want to see things instantly, and God said, my will be done. He commanded me to pray, and I went through a hospital once, and he said, I want you to pray for every room in this hospital, and don't wait to see what happens, because it's not up to you, but it's up to me to have that kind of faith. God's raising up a people. Peter says to add to your faith daily. Are we adding to our faith? Let me tell you the greatest faith. How many here have teenagers? If you don't have faith, you're in trouble. Wait till they get their driver's license and want to drive out on a snowy, icy road like it was last night. That's why most of you weren't here last night. It must have been a stormy night last night. But the fact is, if you want to see what God's doing in your life, begin to thank God for your kids that are going out on a Friday night in a stormy weather. 
We used to live in Gunnison, and man, those roads were icy all winter long. You know, 30 below is like the norm on a lot of nights. And it's like, your kids are going out? <laughs> it's like, no way. But faith is something that God begins to put in our lives. Would you look at somebody and say, I have faith that God's going to make you the fire of God. Do you know what I'm telling you? I'm telling you, expect a miracle. I'm telling you that if you begin to pray for this fellowship and come together, when you come here, you should be coming here to give, to serve, to give of your life. How many here are the God's portion? Say, I'm God's tithing. If you're God's portion, then what's God expect of you? Last night, I gave the people that were here a challenge. I asked them to come here today prepared to get five people on fire for God. Where's Paul? Paul gave me a hard time, so I said, you got to do 10. I also asked him to sit in different places. I, had, I actually had people say, I'll do it, but, but with resentment. <laughs> like, do all things unto the Lord as somebody that's happy to serve God. You know, thank you for doing it. But God's doing a work in people's lives because, number one, how many here are humans? Raise your hand. If you're not raising your hand, you know, I'd like you to participate. If you're not raising your hand, you're either asleep or dead. If you're dead, Pastor Nick's going to give you mouth to mouth. Because, because Ezekiel said, you command the Holy Spirit to breathe life into my church. Ezekiel 37. If we're not understanding what God's doing, do you know what Tom's neighborhood is? Dry bones. And as I walked, I commanded the Holy Spirit to bring life into Tom's neighborhood to honor Tom and Linda. Because I believe in all things through Christ. Say this with me. Christ can do all things through me who strengthens the bride. Look at somebody and just, just flat out shout at them. It's not about you anymore. <laughs> so who's it about? Okay, let me just say this. Anybody that pointed to the ceiling, would you do that again? Okay, look at the ceiling and say, God doesn't live in the drywall anymore. When you say it's about him, where does him live? Would you look at somebody else? Don't point to the drywall. Point to somebody and say, God, it's about you. It's about the bride. It's about the kingdom of God. It's about the anointing that when two or three are together. And I, I, I told him that, thank you for putting up this menorah. Look at that middle branch. It's called the shamus. What's the shamus mean? Is this electric? Is this electric? <laughs> this, is the, this is the servant candle. Now, what's on? How many are on this side? How many on this side? How many non-servants are there? Here's the servant, so how many's left? What's the number of man? And did Messiah say when two or three on my left are gathered together? The goats. Two or three on my right are gathered together. There he is in the very midst. He's teaching menorah. And if you were to light this, when we light our menorah, which is a little, well, that's about the size probably. When we light our menorah with real candles, it's unreal. The smoke detectors go off. It's just, it'll, it's amazing. And, and we have a, like a 27-foot high ceiling. It's, it's amazing what God's doing. But I believe that if we light each other up, we're going to see the power of God's luminescence, the aura of God so strong that we're going to be like a city on a hill. And right now, we're all about division. What box are you in? I'm Southern Baptist. Praise God. I'll pray for you. What are you? Oh, I'm Messianic. Praise God. That's too bad, but it's okay. It's okay because we've got so many areas of division and differences that we haven't understood that in the 6 billion DNA that we have, there's less than one half of 1%, less than that, that's different. You know, we've got different skin color. We've got different eye color. We've got different noses. And this represents a minuscule amount of differences. But we have the percentage of God that's bringing us together. So who loves God with all their heart? 
Have you ever met a Baptist that loves God with all their heart or a Pentecostal or somebody else? Absolutely. Well, so, but we can't break bread together. You know what we have? We can break bread together because we're set free. Somebody say, I'm not in a box anymore. I've been called out of the box. You know, Micah 2.12 says, we're going we're gonna to see somebody break into the sheep pen and take us out and take us to the king. Somebody brought you here. Somebody brought you out of your religious box. And probably some of you felt like you're now in the messianic box. But who brought you out? Now look at somebody and say, you're the person that's supposed to go out and take people out of the box. Okay, if I mention the remnant, what box would you put him in? Here's a good one. If Messiah Yeshua Hamashiach walked on the earth today, what church would he be a member of? <laughs> right here. <laughs> That's what the red shirt, uh, you know, the seats are for, reserved. I cracked up uh, because Pastor Nick has a seat for my wife and I right here. But last night I challenged everybody to sit somewhere different. And I said, where are you sitting? She goes, the second row. I go, why? Because you asked me to sit somewhere different. So <laughs> Pastor Nick looks back and goes, what are you doing back there? <laughs> Thank God for an obedient wife. She's not always obedient, a little secret, but that's why I married her. God said, go out and marry a rebellious woman. And... As we were teasing, you know, Mike this morning, his wife was being complimented. And I go, Mike, you did a great job <laughs> training his wife. So it's like, you know, bad joke. Okay, so uh, I want to take you through some teachings that I want you to see. And the reason I want you to see it is because anti-Semitism is on the rise. Pro-Islam is on the rise. Because Islam believes in Allah, and Allah in Arabic just means the God of Abraham, the God. Just means God. But Paul makes a distinction that we need to be steadfast on. He mentions that we are the children of Isaac, the promise. There's a distinction between Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Abraham, Ishmael, and Esau, the grafted in relative through the, son, through the wives. Ishmael, Esau are descendants of Abraham. But we're not descendants in that lineage. And to serve the God of Abraham is what's being taught that we should assimilate with Islam because we have the same God. And what's amazing, what's absolutely amazing is ISIS is helping that. Because ISIS now took on an Arab nation, Jordan, and we're beginning to see that many of the Arab or Muslim, Muslim, not Arab, many of the Muslim nations are going to come against the terrorists and we're going to embrace them through our great father, Catholicism, because Catholicism is right now teaching the church that we're one, and we're going to make it one. And I'm telling you right now, do not be deceived. Do not be deceived, because the oneness does not come by man's action. It comes by the Spirit of God who's bringing together the unity, because, say this out loud, we are the remnant of God. As we progress, you're going to be tested. You're going to be challenged. Are you steadfast in the word? Are you walking the walk, the halaki relationship? Are you maturing? Are you getting to the point that nothing matters, that every insult that you take, the bait of Satan and all this kind of stuff, every insult you take is just like Messiah taught, turn the other cheek. He wasn't talking about, gee, if, if, if somebody slaps you, turn the It's like every time you're insulted, you're being slapped. And God's raising up a people that live in Goshen in the sense that nothing can come into Goshen like the plagues we went through last night. If you, didn't, if you, didn't, if you missed last night, get a copy of, of whatever, I don't know, DVDs, CDs, or just the paperwork. You know, the fact is, just say this with me. You can't touch me. You know, Israel couldn't be touched. We see that Balak, Bilam, influenced King Balak to seduce them from within. But we can't be touched from outside. We allow the realms of death in our families. Do you, do you understand what the fear of God is? You know, as, as Brother Tom was reading the criteria to choose these men, one of them was those that fear God. How many really fear God? And let me just show you what God's put on my life. 
Do you know why I'm broken before God? Is because I fear losing that presence. I fear losing the covering over my four kids who are serving God. Over my 11 grandkids, three of which are, are about to be into the world system. And you know what? I got faith that God's not going to allow them to go on a detour. I don't care about statistics. We actually stand up and say our kids are not going to be statistics. We, we were so earnest about it. We started a second service after our own egg just for the kids and the families to raise your children in the ways of the Lord. Because right now, here's how it goes. Raise your children in the ways of the Lord and pray like holy guacamole. They'll come back after they leave. That isn't right. It says they will not depart. So we raise them in children's church. We raise them in Sunday school or yeshiva. And we pray like heck that they'll stay. Statistics. We are defiers of t- statistics. We believe that we're going to raise our children in the ways of Yahweh. We're going to engage them in, in, in plays and action to walk out and work out the presence of God in a young person's life so that they know there's only one God There's only one anointing. There's one presence. There's one family, one body, one remnant of God, and they're part of it, and they've been called to serve in it. And I believe we've done one mistake. We said, okay, kids, you can't drink, you can't smoke, you can't chew, you can't go with girls that do, and they get up in the world. Thank you very much, Mr. Allen. Praise God. Thank you very much. I just want to call him Shaul. I don't know. Maybe that's a prophecy over Allen. And we teach our kids, don't, don't, don't. And they get out in the world, and the world says, hey, you can do anything. It's like a ship that's sinking. You know, the bar's open. You can throw people out the window. You can smoke, dope, do whatever you want. Praise God. Hallelujah. And we've got this, this understanding that the world's all about seduction. You know why? Because we haven't taught our kids who they are. How many here are, are 16 through 18? How old are you, Xander? How many here are 14 through 18? If you are, stand up. Pastor Nick, you're a young kid. Stand up. You're young at heart. No, you're young at heart. Today he told me how old he was. It's like, oh, my God, you're really old. We changed his concept. He's the patriarch now, okay, because he's old. But, if you, if you, but Nick's a young man. He's a young at heart. By the way, didn't God call Israel 80-year-old Moses' children? Okay. If you guys are at this age, you know the world's out to get you? It's called the realms of Hasatan, the realms of death. You guys over there too. But you know what? I want you to know, say this with me, you kids. I'm a doer. I can do. Say that louder. I can't hear you guys. Say, I'm a doer. Say, I'm a doer. I'm a doer with a a, a weak voice. God's raising up these kids to understand. Say this with me. I'm a priest of the living God. Say that over here. Can you shout it? No, would you really shout it? Like you're like really passionate. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not trying to embarrass you. I'm trying to bring out the fact that as a priest of God, you have authority to bind and to loose. As a priest of God, you have a right to be separate from the world. Hey, you want to go snort? You say, yes, praise God. I don't care. You don't want to be part of the world. You want to serve God because you're a doer of the word. Somebody say, I'm a doer. Hallelujah. Now, the rest of you say, I'm committed to pray for these six kids that are standing up today. I'm committed. I'm committed. I'm committed because I believe that these six kids have the right to be God's priests and the kingdom of God, and the enemy of the world will not prevail against God's anointed. Thank you. You guys may be seated. I've got a sermon up here, but we're probably not going to do it because I'll have to put on my reading glasses to see this iPad that Pastor, Pastor Russell gave me. So. God's doing a work today, you know, and he's doing it. You know, Pastor Nick <laughs> made a comment this morning at the leadership meeting about uh, the autopsy of the church, <laughs> of the deceased church. Well, I, I like my way better. <laughs> because the autopsy should be on the living church, but the fact is, it's all over both the Old Testament and the New, the Tanakh and the Brit, that the word sleep is synonymous with the word death. And if we're asleep, we're not serving God. 
When you're, when you're sleeping or dead spiritually, where's your focus? For instance, if you're discouraged and depressed, what's your focus on? Yourself. By the way, let's say that Will is, is discouraged. What's your job, Tim? Comfort those that mourn. So what would you do to him? You would comfort him. Change his focus. Do you know that the living water is about status change? You take the living... By the way, where does the living water live? In us, out of your innermost being. So out of your innermost being, you come up and hug him and get water all over him. It's like... Change his status. You have the right, because we're the body of Messiah, to heal the body, because Messiah is in you. Messiah is giving you that authority. I want to teach you something up here that's called the law of Sota. Because Messiah, I heard this not too long ago on the radio. I'm driving down, I listen to Christian radio, and, and there's a commentary by this young woman. And she said, when Jesus was uh, tempted by the Pharisees about a woman caught in adultery, he changed the law and got rid of it and gave mercy and grace to this adulterous woman. I want to show you what Messiah did. He taught a greater Torah. So as we say, have this, have this, have, have this uh, concept here in Numbers 5, the law of Sotah. When a husband is jealous and suspects his wife, the priest will bend down and ride in the sand and take some sand from the holy place and mix it with the living water, living water, and if the woman is guilty, she will then die. And it goes on to explain how she'll die. And it's not a pretty picture. And through Jewish history, there's never been a woman ever brought to this point. So, women, let me ask you. If your husband suspects you of, of unfaithfulness, and he says, I'm going to take you to the priest. And if you're guilty, you know, your belly's going to explode, your thigh's going to go bananas, and you're just going to be instantly non-existent. How many women, if you're guilty, will say, gee, I can't wait to go and prove him wrong? Wouldn't a woman say, you know, honey, I'm just going to split to Mexico. It's no big deal. Adios, I'm taking the kids and all the money. That's why there's never been a case of this in Jewish history. And so we see that, we see that a concept in John. Here's Messiah, John 8, 3 through 5. And the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. According to the Torah, Moshe commanded us that such a person guilty of this should be stoned. So what then do you say, Messiah, hoping he would violate the Torah, which he did not, hoping that they could hang him out to dry because he, he would be against the Torah and they would take him out and stone him? But exactly what did he do? John 8, 6. And then they said, trying him so that they might accuse him. But Yeshua, bending down the priest back in, in Numbers, he bent down on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear them, writing in the sand. Now, we, don't, we can speculate what he wrote, but that's not the point. The point was the priest had to bend down in the sand. And here's a picture that we need to see. Messiah was keeping the Torah because here's a woman caught in adultery, so he was bending down because he wasn't changing the Torah. If the accusers were there, how many accusers would have to stay there? Two, minimum two to three. And if they were still there, what would be done? She would be stoned. But he was using the authority of God, and he went back to the law of Sotah, Numbers 5, and he wrote in the sand, which is what the priest would have done. Been down in the sand, take the patience of God, ask for God's wisdom, and then come up with that sand. So here, I'm trying to get this to go here. There we go. Messiah bent down because that's what the priest did in the Torah. Verse 7, But as they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And he bent down again. He bent down again. The second time is a concept out of Hosea that after the second day, and we see the second time being bent, he's going to rise up and we're going to see something that's phenomenal. And as they kept on questioning him, he, he, uh, he said to them, who, He who is out sin among you, let him be the first. And bending down again, he wrote in the sand. Okay, in verse 9, and when, he, and when they heard it, being reproved by their conscience, went out one by one. Now, you've heard the teaching before, and I'm not going to spend all the time on that. But the fact is, how could there be a witness because, because what would, the act that we're talking about wasn't done in the public square. It was done behind closed doors. And in order to have seen it, maybe they had been participating in it. And perhaps they had. 
So beginning with the older ones until the last, and Yeshua was left alone and the woman standing in the middle. We see this presence of God who began to realize, and the Holy Spirit was the conscience that began to deal with these men. And the fact is, we don't have two or three witnesses anymore, so who's left there to accuse her? No one. So we're not going to stone her. He didn't change the stoning laws. He simply said, I need two or three witnesses. And that was, that was what's being implied here. And Yeshua straightening up and seeing no one but the woman said to her, Woman, where are your accusers? Zechariah 3. And Satan was with God. Zechariah 3, 1. And he was accusing Joshua. And God said to the accuser, what? Be gone. By the way, where's your accuser? you got the blood of the Lamb on you. Do you understand Passover? It's the beginning of the patrol of process because you got the mark. i got the ring. i got the mark. The spirit world sees the mark on my head and my hands. How many sang that song, the right hand of God? Would you raise your right hand? Say, that's the right hand of God because the right hand means the work of God. And everything you put your hands to, say this with me, everything I put my hands to, everything I put my hands to will be to serve Yahweh. Do you realize what you're saying? Are you guys ready for the test that's coming on Monday? You know, how many, how many can come on Sabbath and get on fire? I'm alive. I'm on fur. And my spirit's full of desire. You know, Sabbath is easy. You know, especially when you got Susie in the band. You know, we called her Jimi Hendrix this morning. <laughs> it's easy. But how many are just so excited to serve God on Tuesday? I mean, you might get all pumped up Sunday night. I'm going to get up tomorrow. I'm going I'm to stomp the ground, holy ground, and I'm going to serve God. I'm going to ask for divine appointments. But somewhere around Wednesday or Thursday, it's like, you know, life just vacuums. I can't use that other word. I'm going to pray right now, and I'm going to ask you to pray for the person on your left and your right, or behind you, or in front of you, that by Wednesday and Thursday, you're still on fire. And you're going to test this week. You're going to commit to this week. In Yeshua, I ask this in your name. May it be so. Glory to God. Would you, pray that, would you pray that prayer with me for the person to your left and right? And believe. Believe in miracles. So anyway, woman, where are your accusers? Do, did no one condemn you? And he said, no one, Master. And Yeshua said to her, neither do I condemn you. Because Jesus didn't come to judge. Go and sin no more. You know what sin no more means? You remember when he talked to the, to the lepers that were healed? He said, go back to the priest because you're not officially healed until they say so because that's the Torah. And see, we've thrown the Torah out. Don't you love what Paul says? If it wasn't for the Torah, I wouldn't know what sin is in, in Romans 7. Do you know what's wrong with our believers in the world today? We got rid of the Torah. So our kids grow up confused. They don't know what sin is. So here we are on Sunday. Glory to God, hallelujah. We got a kid speaking in tongues. We got the whole thing. And what happens on next Saturday night? Boogie nights or <laughs> whatever. Maybe that's a little old. But, you know, we're just throwing our kids to the woods because we haven't prepared them with authority. These six kids that we prayed for, we want to prepare them with authority that they can go into the world and not be of the world. They can be steadfast. They can be tempted by everything of sex, drugs, rock and roll. But you know what? God's going to say, I'm anointed by God and I'm chosen to be holy and separate unto you because I'm an Exodus 19 priest. And so here's Peter in 1 Peter 2, 5 and 9, and he says to the Jews, you're a kingdom of priests. It's like, Peter, what's wrong with you? We're not Levites. You know what God's restoring? The firstborn. It's habikarim. It literally means those that are God's portion. Don't get caught up in the bloodline. Well, gee, I'm not firstborn son. How many women here are not firstborn sons? Oh, you're disqualified if we were real messianics. But the fact is, you are God's anointed. You're the first fruits that's going to serve God. You've been chosen to be holy and separate unto God. You've been chosen to be a royal priesthood. You've been chosen to be kadosh. Holy, holy, holy. God's raising up a family. If women don't think they're priests, then forget about being a good wife and a good mother to your kids. It starts in the home. If you want to be a leader, you start with one. And you look in the mirror and say, God's chosen me to be anointed. He's chosen me to be separate and holy. He's chosen me to rise up and take authority over the realms of death in my household and in the door that people walk in. 
And I, I did this once. I, I pastored a church back in 1973. I wasn't even out of Bible college yet. A lady called me and, and said, I'm sick. Would you come and preach here? She knew I was in Bible college. And somebody knew of me. And so I went out there and, and preached several times. And then she calls me up and says, by the way, I'm really sick and I'm moving back to Kansas. And the church is yours. <laughs> it's like, oh, <laughs> what am I going to do with this, Lord? And so I'm on fire for God. I'm a young man. And I, I feel like we take young men on fire and say, boy, with a fire like that, you need to go to Bible college. And here are all these young kids on fire go to Bible college, and they come out of Bible college stoic. Where's your fire? <laughs> I got the rules now. I'm in season. I know every, you know. And so one night I was just down there early at the church praying, and it was a Wednesday night service, and, and I was just, I, I anointed all the chairs and the doors, and I said, Father God, don't let any realms of death come through these front doors. And it dawned on me later, I didn't come in the front doors. I came in the side door from the parsonage. So I didn't come in the front doors that I anointed. I didn't, I didn't anoint that door. And guess how many people showed up that night? Not one. Not one. And a God began to say, your word is my authority. I want the unclean here. Thank you very much, Mr. Allen. Shaul. My authority on this earth is God's authority. I'm trying to shake you out of being nice, mild-mannered Christians. I'm trying to shake your boat and rock your, your whole future because God's going to raise up the trees if Bet Tehillah is not raised up. Amen. Say this with me. I'm tired of being a nice, passive person. Do you think Messiah, Yeshua, was this mild-mannered, wimpy dude? He spoke with what? They were amazed at his teachings because he spoke with... Say, that, say this with me. I am the authority of Messiah. And God's going to use you. God's going to use you. Just walking down the street, meeting the Baptist on the corner. My final question with him, how many people in your church are on fire for God? I always get the answer, one or two. It's like, why not all of you? Because the teachings of Messiah said all of you are the light of the world. How many of you are so powerful in the anointing that you're the salt of the earth and a city on a hill that can't be hidden? Do you know what this whole witnessing to this Baptist was? Salt. Salt preserves. Salt challenges. Salt hurts the wounds. But salt brings us to the point that if our salt has lost its savor, then you're diddly squat. Somebody here say, I want my savor back. I want my savor back. God's, gonna re- God's doing that here. This, is, this particular day that I'm here has the least amount of people in this fellowship that I've ever seen. Okay. And I know that God's pruning. And God's doing a work. But I believe the pruning is just about over. So anybody here need to be pruned out? If you do, and you know it, then leave right now. It's okay. <laughs> Pastor Nick's going, shut up. <laughs> now nobody got up and left. You know what God's doing in the pruning? He's not cutting. He's challenging you to bear fruit. If you're not bearing fruit, you should be pruned. Hey, don't get mad at me. That's what the Bible says. And if the Bible says it, then perhaps we should listen to the words of God. So neither do I accuse you. Sin no more. That's the Torah. Sin no more is a Hebrew idiom that simply says, keep the word of God. Where's the word of God today? Doesn't the new co- if you're waiting for the new covenant, you missed the boat. The New Covenant says, I'm going to write it on your heart. How many people here, you know, 10 years ago, 5 years ago, a year ago, were, were just so excited? You read, you read Jeremiah 31 or Hebrews 8.10 and you said, oh, wow, I can't wait for the Torah to be written on my heart and my mind. And now you write home to mama and say, the Torah is on my heart and my mind. They're going, oh, God, pray for you. You're under the law. Isn't that ironic that Hebrews 8.10 says, I'm going to write the Torah on your heart and mind? On your hand, your heart, your mind. It is awesome. And yet that's what God's doing today. And let God write it on your heart. 
Don't be so worried about being legalistic or having to do the whole liturgy and all the things that we do in the Messianic movement because God's raising up a people that are on fire for God and have the word of God, the Torah. As Pastor Nick said, he's a spirit-filled Torah observant man of God. That's what God's going to use because that's the bridge. That's the anointing. That's the, that's the Tanakh, the Torah, and the Brit. Because everything Messiah taught was not a new religion. He didn't teach the ritual application. He taught the hidden meanings like this one in the Law of Sotah. So he didn't change the Torah. There needed to be two to three witnesses, and I've already said that. But he gave mercy, has said. Hyena, you got, to, you got your notes. Quickly, I want to get to the second teaching real quick because it's important. I want you to see this. Say this with me. Can you read it with me? I am... Say this with me. I am the salt of the earth. But if the salt becomes tasteless, how shall it be seasoned? For it is no longer of any use but to be thrown out and to be trodden down by men. Can I ask you what the world thinks of Christianity? We have spent 2,000 years defiling, being killers of Muslims through the Crusades. We've done all sorts of, of things that the world looks at us and says, and says, there is nothing about Christianity that has any use. The world's going to trodden down Christianity. But those, thank you, Rabbi. And so those that are anointed by God are going to reveal that, that Ezekiel 36. If you don't know Ezekiel 36, memorize it. Because God's going to use you, especially verse 23. And if you can't find the translation that says that you, the Shekinah is going to be revealed by you, find a different translation. But the point I'm trying to make is there's going to be a remnant who's going to bring down the governments of the world. They're going to be the seventh vial in the book of Revelation, and they're going to establish the government of, of God in the world today, and the governments of the world will become the governments of God. That's the last vial, and it's happening right now. Don't get caught up in the future teaching that the church is teaching. Start beginning to believe that God is the God of who is, and right now God's est establishing his authority. Somebody get excited and say, I think it's through me. I think it's through me. If it's not through you, then point to somebody and say, is it you? If, I, if, if you remember anything about a short old weird guy from, from the town of Fruita, it's the fact that I'm here to challenge you to become God's anointed, to become the light of the world, to become the salt of the earth, to become the living water that we talked about last night, to be God's anointed and walk as if you know him. Well, some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away to that land. I don't know the second verse. If you're still in the some days, you've missed him. You know, there is a fact that there is a God who is to come. And we get all excited about the God who was because we're students of knowledge. But what about the God who is? Where is he at today? Where is he at today? And you know what? How many people do you know call themselves Christ-like, and yet they're still waiting for the second coming or third coming or fourth coming? You know, and, and it doesn't matter what you believe in. You know, whether you missed the rapture of 1988. How many here missed that rapture? You know? Do you know how many people died in 1988? Enough to be raptured. And yet you didn't, you didn't die. God's calling the people to reveal his glory. And I believe if you're in, the, how many are in this room here today? How many can hear me today? Say this, for such a time as this, God stuck me in this church. And if you're hearing this voice, you are going to be challenged to serve God. How many used to believe that you serve God with 90% when you didn't keep the fourth commandment? We, we thought it was 100, but, you know, Jesus nailed it to the cross, and then you find out it wasn't a cross, it was a stavros. Stavros means stake or branch, fulfilling the prophecies. I'm just messing with your minds here a little bit, but the point is, you know, God is asking you if you're sold out for him. The Ten Commandments were given to us as a foundation, you know, we don't sit around and condemn people for keeping nine, but what we can do is teach them about, do you believe in Messiah? Then how come you're not on fire for God? 
Because God's calling you to challenge people to be the light of this world. So let me get through some of this, this stuff here. Verse 14, you're the light of this world. It's impossible for a city to be hidden on a mountain, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. And, and let your light shine so far be, uh, before men so that they see your good works and praise your Father which is in heaven. What are your good works? The world's going to see the works of God. If, if your boss comes to you in, in, a, in a meeting and says, I am just so sick of you and your religious attitudes that I want you to change. <coughs> Excuse me. And you say, praise God, thank you for being a challenge in my life, boss. And everybody else is saying, you're going to punch him out? You're different. Your light's going to shine. No, say this, nobody can touch me. Do not allow anybody to touch your shalom zone, your Goshen, your separation to God. When you allow somebody to tick you off, you just said, I don't care about the God in me. Come on in and destroy me. Turn your cheek. Say, insult me again. It doesn't matter. You are God's. Would you look at somebody and say, I prophesy over the person next to me <coughs> that you're going to be God's anointed this week. Let me show you a couple of quick things because, because the rabbi is walking down the stairs to say five minutes. Hallelujah. Praise God. We're going to change Alan's name to Shaul because he looks like Rabbi Shaul, doesn't he? So look at the word salt. It's the Greek word halos. But it comes from the Hebrew word malak, not, not the king, but the salt to season, to preserve, to protect, to heal, to rub together and protect a wound. It's, it's important to realize it's coming from the commandment shamar. Do you know what shamar is? It's not shema, but it comes from that root word. It means to protect. That's what the salt is. Guard it. Guard it. Be steadfast. Guard the word of God and guard it in your family and others that, that are being led astray or being seduced or tempted. You have the authority to be that salt. Let me take you to the next verse. Uh, Genesis 2.15, and, and Yahweh excuse me, Yahweh Elohim took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to work it and to guard it. Shamar. To work it. How many here are working it? Doesn't James say, I don't care what you say you believe in. It's by your works that I'll tell you what you believe. We've been told works is a four-letter word. Well, you know what? It's not. Because you're supposed to be works. It's a five-letter word. So now it's okay. You know, and God says that you're going to do. Salvation is free. Actually, it's not. John 3.16 has a contingency for God to love the world that he whoever pistieu believes. Do you know where the word pistieu, belief, comes from in, in Hebrew? Shema. Hear, obey, and do, and it also means to complete. The kingdom of God is going to be completed by the people sitting next to you. Thank them. So he put them in the garden to work at Isaiah 61. Heal the broken heart and comfort all who mourn. Look at the word light. It comes from the Greek word phos. It's where we get match, phosphorus. This word phos literally comes through the Septuagint. Through the, I have, a, I have a, a whole program called Greek to Hebrew and Hebrew to Greek. So I can take this Greek word phos and go back into Hebrew. And it comes from a couple, of, <coughs> a couple of Hebrew words. Let me show you. In the Greek, it means to shine or make manifest, especially by rays of light, shining forward, luminescent in the wildest application, natural or artificial, abstract or concrete, literal or figurative, fire or light. That's just the Greek word. But let me take you back to the Hebrew. Greek, phos, from the Septuagint, the word is nair. You see those six branches? Each one of those is a nair. Each one of the menorah branches is a lamp. A lamp unto my feet. The, 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 the psalmist says, Torah is a lamp unto my feet. We see that Messiah said, and the truth will set you free. John 8, 32, but it also goes back to Psalms 119, 142 that says the Torah is the truth. Don't get worried about people thinking you're under the law. It's those that are under the law who serve God, those that walk in God's authority, those that have the anointing of God to walk in the teachings and instructions and obedience to God. Somebody say, that sounds tough, but praise God, I'm going I'm to do that. So we look at the word Nair. 
And I, I give it to you in Hebrew if you're, if you're a student of Nair or, or Hebrew. And uh, let's go to the next one here. Properly meaning to glisten a lamp, that is the burner or light, literally, figuratively, a candle, light, or lamp, a lampstand put, uh, put all together is the menorah. And two or three are together, which we talked about earlier. The six candles of the menorah, the number for man, with the servant candle in the middle, Yeshua, the Shamash, in the very midst to light the six candles, you. Two or three together, you have authority. When we see that in Acts 2, we see an anointing of the word given at, at Mount Upper Room. It's the same Torah that was given at Sinai, but everybody at Sinai died, and it was given again at Horeb, which was the second generation, and the second generation added one commandment. There's 613 plus one, and the second generation survived. The second generation that we see in Davarim is because they had a circumcised heart. They had a heart for God. Jeremiah 4.4 4 says that we need to be circumcised of the heart to be God's anointed. That's the beginning of transformation. And so we see here that authority when two or three of you are together, and Peter's whole world was turned upside down until two or three were together. When two or three were together, they were. Look at, look at the book of Acts after Acts 2. Didn't they do the same things Messiah did? Didn't they walk like Messiah, act like Messiah? They were the picture of Messiah, but they were called the bride. Where's the bride today? Where's the bride that's two or three together? You know, look at Proverbs 18.1. Those that take themselves out of the fellowship, God says, are fools because they have no authority. Don't we need authority? Where's the power in the anointing today? Somebody say it's coming to Bet Tehillah. Not because of you, but because of the person next to you. Look at, look, at, look at all these men here. You men are the bride. I don't care how macho you are. That's why God says even the comely are his. <laughs> You're not beautiful brides. One, one thing God's doing right now is he's, he's asking if we can get men committed to God. I asked our men, how we say, to make a commitment to God, to make a commitment to stop being men and be anointed vessels of the priesthood of God. Start being a priest in the mirror. Start being a priest at home. Start being a priest to your kids and start being a priest at work. Go to work. Go to work and say, I'm coming through this door. Here's the door. And before I come through it, I'm going to put my foot on holy ground and I'm going to holler out. And you may not do this out loud, but I go into stores and I go into places of business and I say, darkness has to flee because I'm in the room. Hallelujah. And the glory of God will be in this room. If you men would be challenged to do that, you're going to change your whole lifestyle. You're not going to be the wussies that we are. You're going to be the authority of God. And you're going to challenge darkness to flee because God's light's in the world. Say, somebody, some men say that. So I'm the light of the world. Go into your home this afternoon and say, wait, honey, don't go in the door. We're going to open the door and we're going to step across the threshold and we're going to say, darkness is no longer allowed in my house and the light of the world will always prevail. And because you're married and married people don't get along, if you have a disagreement, step outside. Because you just pronounced the glory of God in your house. I'm serious. Make it physical. Paul says the physical comes first. The physical comes first. So how many here... Mikvah. Mikvah doesn't do anything, but if you're in the Colorado River, it just gives you bacteria from people upstream that threw their waste in it. You know, the point is, we mikvah in the Colorado not because it's a holy, righteous river. It's because it's flowing, and I want our people to be clean in the spirit. So, you know, look at James. says, wash you ha your hands, you people that have missed the mark. Because we sinners, because you need to have a pure heart. It's obedience to the physical that brings the spiritual. So here we go. From Greek to Hebrew, we also see the word phos comes from the Hebrew word or. And, and the number there is your strongs, your concordance. So we see that 215 is illumination or concretely uh, lum luminary in every sense, including lightning, happiness, etc. Did you know the light of the world means happiness too? Praise God. Bright, clear, day, daylight, morning, sun. Ora. Look at or. The Hebrew word or means the light. Here's the or. But ora, who you are, is the light of God. You've got Yah in there. Praise God. Goshen did not have the plague of darkness, and they brought the realms of Yahweh with them. Exodus 14, 20. 
the cloud of Yahweh stationed itself between the camp of Egypt and the camp of Israel. And there was a cloud and darkness here in the Egyptian camp, but light by night in the Israel camp so that no one did not come near the other all night long. That was the same plague of darkness during the, the ninth plague that we see that they brought the light of God with them. And the light of the world is who you are. Do you, can you bring it into a dark place of business? Can you bring it into the realms of, of uh, businesses? How many shop at, at that pagan store called Public? I don't, I don't even know the name of Albertsons or Safeway. I don't even know what's out here. When you go into Public next time or you go into Sam's or wherever you go, it's a dark world. They just want to get your money and they got, they got healthy food and it's got drugs in it. You know, they're lying to you and all these kind of things. It's organic. It means that we threw live feces on it. You know, whatever. The point is, ask the light of the world to be in that area and give you a divine appointment. And I guarantee you, somebody's going to run their card into yours. And instead of getting ticked off and say, what are you doing? You blind? The answer is yes. Do you know why Pharaoh was blind? It's because God put darkness in their life. Do you know why the whole world's blind today and can't see who Israel is? Because God put blindness in their life. But who's going to cause the blind to see? Who's going to comfort those that mourn? Who's going to cause the lame to walk? If you look at the spiritual realm, somebody caused your blindness to go away. Somebody caused your inability to walk the halakhic relationship, and, and you were lame, and now you can walk. You know, when we were Christians, we'd cause the blind to walk and the lame to see. But God's raising up a people that are going to keep the Word of God. Somebody say, I pray that's me. I really do. I pray God's doing a work in us. That Goshen, that Goshen bubble, no true light. If you seek the knowledge of the Torah but do not apply it to your walk, <coughs> then you're, you know, look at this. This walk is about knowledge. And we gather all the knowledge we can, but if you're not applying it to your walk, you're not his light. So take what you have here today and begin to apply it to your life. Take what Pastor Nick teaches out of, out of Isaiah 40 through 66, and the fact is that's the restoration of the kingdom of God. Take Ezekiel 36 and become the Shekinah. Take the words of God and begin to teach the sud of what, what we need to see in that New Testament concept because it comes out of Torah. I'll, I'll just challenge you. Everything Messiah taught, every one of his teachings and parables come out of the Torah or the prophets. Do you know that? And without that foundation, since we threw the Torah out, we don't understand the depth. Look at the depth of the law of Sotah when Jesus was dealing that, with that woman with adultery. Look at the light that goes back to the menorah. And we see the light lights the pathway. Can you imagine walking a pathway in the dark? Well, that's what we used to do, but now you got the light of Messiah. So praise God. Apply it to your life. In a twinkling of an eye, I wanted to talk about this. In a twinkling of an eye, we, how many here believe or have been taught that someday in a twinkling of an eye we'll be just like Jesus? Okay, let's go back to Hebrew. The many facets in the realms of the kingdom of God are many. When we take a child, a baby, when you take a baby, how, how many mothers can, can relate to this? When, when a baby's potty training and you put him on the potty and 10 hours later, he gets up and says, Mommy, I'm sore. I, and, and like, did you go? No. So you put a diaper back on him. Within 10 minutes, he's already gone. Like, does that mean if you kept him on the potty 10 more minutes, he would have gone? No. He's comfortable with his diapers. He's comfortable in that state. That's what we are. We don't want to change. How many here really were upset when I asked you to sit somewhere else? Don't raise your hand because I'll embarrass you. Um, we don't like change. We're humans. We don't like change. But you know, God's all about change. God is about change. God's about taking a walk, and I don't want to take this walk because I don't have faith in that walk. I got faith in this walk because in 1952, the word of the Lord came to me, and by golly, I'm stuck on old wine and old manna. But if I step in here, I have no faith, but God's going to give you the faith. Take it out of thought for what you're going to do and walk in the faith because God's going to raise up a people who are no longer worried about what's going to happen. They're going to know that God's in control, and the glory of God will be revealed when you step out of your little box. In a twinkling of an eye, one day, the little kid comes to mommy and says, Mommy, i got to go potty. It's like, wow, wh where did that happen? I've been putting you on the, the, the baby potty for a year and a half now. And in a twinkling of an eye, you want to go to the bathroom. Hallelujah. That's, that's one realm in this child's life. 
In a twinkling of an eye, they push you away and they grab the spoon and feed themselves. In a twinkling of an eye, they, they say, I, I don't want you to carry me. I want to walk, mommy. In a twinkling of an eye, you become spiritual in one area. In a twinkling of an eye, God reveals the Sabbath to you. In a twinkling of an eye, you get the fact that you're God's anointed. We're children, and God's raising up a children, children of God, the children of Israel. We didn't replace Israel. We're grafted in, and the natural branches that believe in Messiah are going to be regrafted. You guys saw that movie, Let the Lion Roar, but God's raising up the kingdom of God. He's raising up, and somebody say, in a twinkling of an eye, I'm becoming just like him. Stop waiting. Become like him in areas of your life, and God will never put a test in your life you can't pass. He will give you one test at a time, and you will not overcome all tests because God has said, I'll give you one. If I gave you all of them, the enemy would come out and and wipe you out. He doesn't want you to fail. He wants you to succeed. I, I believe that's a miracle of God. Somebody say with me, I believe in miracles. And it's going to start in me. Hallelujah. John 5, 46. For if you, uh, do not think I shall accuse you before the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moshe, in whom you have set your expectation. For if you believed Moses, how many here believe in the teachings of Moses? How many here didn't used to believe in the teachings of Moses? But if you believe in the teachings of Moses, you would believe me. Oh, scary stuff. Scary stuff. Do you know what this is all about? It's about you helping people to take off the veil, to cause the blind to see. It's an amazing day, isn't it? Praise God. Verse 47, but if you do not believe in his writings, Moses, how shall you believe my words? Oh, my gosh. You should go to some people's Bibles and say, excuse me, let me, let me uh, get my scissors out and cut that out of your Bible because you don't want to see this. It's funny, when we came into this walk, we didn't believe that. But yet, we had it underlined. But we never understood it. It's amazing. Here we go. No true light. Do not think I come to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to destroy it, but to complete it. Here we go. Last slide. Praise God, if we can get it there. For truly, I say to you, till the heaven and the earth pass away, not one jot or tittle shall pass by no means, uh, by no means pass from the Torah till all is done. And whosoever then breaks... One of these least of these commandments. This scripture is not read. But whosoever breaks the least of these commandments. Are we talking about the Torah? And teaches people about the Torah and breaks it. Shall be called the what in the kingdom of God? But whosoever does. Say, that's me. Your teacher. By the way, the word teaching in Hebrew, moray or, or lamech, doesn't mean to have a platform. It means to be a witness of God. That it radiates. The teachings of God is who you are. It's a phenomenal concept of, of moray. But whoever does them and teaches them shall be called the what in the kingdom of God? Can you guys say that a little louder? I'm out of time, so don't worry about it. This probably won't be on the CD, so don't worry about it. Would you look at somebody and say, is that you? Do not then worry about tomorrow. This just needed to be in there. <laughs> because don't we worry about tomorrow? What's the biggest conference going right now? ISIS or Islam? The prophecy teaching. Do you know what prophecy is? It's for the immature. I'm not trying to insult you. I'm trying to help you. How far is Orlando? Have you ever taken your kids there? And it's an hour and a half drive, hour, whatever. And you're 10 minutes from home and the kids are going, are we there yet, Daddy? Are we there yet? Speak to me about the prophecy of Disneyland, Disney World. I want to know, Dad. Well, Matterhorn's closed. Oh, no. Oh. Uh, you know, and these kids are so immature, they can't wait to get there, even if Matterhorn's closed. I don't even know if they have a Matterhorn, but, but the point I'm trying to make is that's where we are. Where are the little children go, is it time yet? What's going to happen tomorrow, Daddy? Is Islam going to take over the world? Oh, my God, what do we do? Do we have to go, you know, Baruch Atah Allah? We're not going to worry about it, are we? Do you know that God's in control? Do you know that God told you to pray for Obama? You know, don't complain about Obama. You know why God said to pray for Obama? Because he needs a lot of prayer. You know, God established it. Did Joseph pray for Pharaoh? And what happened to him? He took over the world. (coughs) He's second in charge, and then all of a sudden, people come to Pharaoh, and they say, I don't know, ask Joseph. He's in charge of the world. I'm just a puppet figure. 
Pray for God. Pray for God's anointing in your government. Start praying for people. You know, we're, we're so rebellious. We, we rebel against pastors, against elders, against congressmen, against the laws. How many here where it says 35 miles an hour, go 40? You just re- say, I'm rebellious. <laughs> and I, I'm not trying to assault you, but, you know, Samuel says rebellion is akin to witchcraft. <laughs> anyway, don't be rebellious. Serve God. Anyway. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow shall have its own problems, worries. Each day has enough evil in itself. Somebody, stand with me. Let's finish this sermon. The next step. Say, I, I am in the walk. On the walk. So take the next step. Don't go backwards. I, I know you're in aisles. Take the step. Say, I walk on holy ground, and I have faith to take the next step. Do you know what comes if you have faith enough to take the next step? I love that right there. What's that say? Look at somebody say, you need to be promoted if you would take the next step. Amen. Praise God. Say this with me. I'm the menorah. I'm the light of the world. I've got Goshen in my life, and I'm going to protect its boundaries. Amen. Praise God. Don't let anyone take your shalom zone with a plague. Anybody know what shalom zone is? Peace. Shalom. Peace. Don't let anybody steal your peace. Say that to somebody. Prophesy. Tim, stop allowing the world to steal your peace. Amen. Willie, it's time that you begin to walk in God's authority and peace every day of your life, even Thursday. Praise God. Bitterness, resentment, anger can't touch me. Can't touch me. Remember that old song? I don't remember it. It, 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 I think that guy's a Christian. You can't touch this. You can't touch this. You can't touch this unless I give you the right, and I'm not going to give it anymore. Nobody's got the right to take my peace. Nobody's going to slap me with bitterness, resentment, and anger, and unforgiveness. Anybody here still have unforgiveness? Raise your hand, and we'll make fun of you. No, we all have realms of unforgiveness. But in the Hebrew understanding, there's three phases of, of forgiveness, and the last one is as if it never happened. There was, there was an elder in our church that left the church, and he was just bitter. He wrote emails about how he's going to tear down my church, God's church, and, and tear me down. And I happened to do a funeral for somebody that didn't go to our church, and I did this funeral, and he was there. And I walked up to him, and he was like, Ugh, here comes Pastor Chris. I walked up to him, and I just gave him a bear hug, and he stood there like this, and I just said, I love you, brother. Hallelujah. And he was so, it was like heaping coals into his little heart. Praise God. Don't have it. Say, I can't, you can't touch it. Look at somebody, set, set boundaries around your shalom zone. Praise God, hallelujah. All of you say this out loud. Today, I'm being transformed. Transformed. Third time, transformed. Amen, hallelujah. Because in a twinkling of an eye, I'm becoming more like him. Somebody give God some glory. Let God inhabit the praises of God, hallelujah. Would you, would you not finish the service? Would you, would you minister to somebody? Would, by the way, how many men here made a commitment to God today? Just two of you? All the rest of you are going to hell. It's, uh, it's really sad. Let me ask you, how many men here want to make a commitment to serve only God? Okay, keep your right hand up. Say, I'm going to serve God at work. I'm going to serve God at the grocery store. I'm going to serve God with my wife. And when the two of us are together, watch out world. Hallelujah. Okay, if you're with somebody, man, grab another man's hand and say, when the two of us are together or the three of us are together, the power and the anointing of God is going to rule and reign in this world. So, women, are you willing to make a commitment to God? Okay, here here you are, women, you stoic little sweethearts. I want all women here to take two steps forward. You know, just step on the chair. Step on the person. It doesn't matter. Say, I've just now stepped into an area in which I have to have faith. Good. You know what that means? On Monday, you're going to be tested. Don't let anybody take your shalom. You live in Goshen. There's a Goshen bubble around his people. You can't touch it. Anybody excited about what's going to happen this week? Amen. Praise God. God's doing a work. And for, and for you that are here today, would you look around at all the empty seats? Pastor Nick is gracious enough to have me back in the spring and the fall. He, he, he called me and said, when would you like to come? I said, well, the most snow's in February. So he said, well, then come in February. 
And I'll be back this fall, probably before Sukkot. And I'm going to just let you know, if these seats aren't full, watch out. Watch out. Anybody with me? Anybody afraid of me? (laughs) Fear God. If you fear God, you'll never fear anything the rest of your life. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let's give God a praise. We love you, Lord. We thank you. We give you all honor. Praise the Lord. Let's give Pastor Nick a hand, uh, the patriarch of this church. Glory to God. This is the man. Hallelujah. I didn't realize how old he was, but because I've always said I'm, I'm like your father figure. That's right. And, and as his father, I've, I, I got, God put him on my heart several years ago. And I called him up and said, God's put you on my heart, and I'm going to keep you in my prayer. And we have been close ever since. He's established that we're, we're sister churches. I sort of think we're brother churches. And, and we are in covenant together to see the kingdom of God. And I want to tell you one thing. In this movement, it is about how to be a Jew how to learn Hebrew, and it's not about the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is what we're about to rule and to reign, and the Spirit of God's going to flow through Bet Tehillah. And I prophesy that, I believe it, and God's going to bring about His presence because we have a man that fears God. If you fear God, Romans 3, 18, you'll never fear anything, and the fear of the Lord is upon this home. And I don't want you to lose that because that's the covering of God. It's a covering over your families. It's a covering over, over your businesses, over your anointing, and over your children. And by the way, how many people, raise your hand, do not have children in this church? Okay. Now, repent. Repent. Because every child in this church is, is, is Kevin, is this your son's? Hey, would you guys step, come out here? Say this with me. I'm not Kevin's son anymore. Okay, what are you? You're a child of the king, and this is the kingdom of aunts and uncles. And I challenge all of you to be parents, <laughs> parents and aunts and uncles. This is a family. Mishpaha. This is la familia. This is the kingdom of God. Start treating each other like you care. Even if you have to pretend for a while, it's okay. But begin to let God rule and reign. Bless you. What's your names? James and Joey. Would you raise your hand? Say, I accept the power and the anointing from this fellowship to pray for me. Kevin, is it okay if these people really care about your kids? Amen. Praise God. There you go. Praise Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. change we're humans we don't like change but you know God's all about change God is about change God's about taking a walk and I don't want to take this walk because I don't have faith in that walk I got faith in this walk because in 1952 the word of the Lord came to me and by golly I'm stuck on old wine and old manna but if I step in here I have no faith but God's gonna give you the faith take it out of thought for what you're gonna do and walk in the faith because God's gonna raise up a people who are no longer worried about what's gonna happen they're gonna know that God's in control And the glory of God will be revealed when you step out of your little box. Say this, nobody can touch me. Do not allow anybody to touch your shalom zone. Your Goshen. Your separation to God. When you allow somebody to tick you off, you just said, I don't care about the God in me. Come on in and destroy me. Turn your cheek. Insult me again. It doesn't matter. You are God's. Would you look at somebody and say, I prophesy over the person next to me that you're going to be God's anointed this week.